Thank you for joining this Onc Live peer exchange entitled Metastatic Prostate Cancer, a Practical Review of Therapy. The treatment of prostate cancer has changed significantly in the last decade owing to the introduction of several novel therapeutic strategies. Yet challenges remain in, the selecting, in selecting the optimal course of treatment for an individual patient with metastatic disease. Uh, there is growing appreciation for the biologic heterogeneity of advanced prostate cancer and the need for more personalized approaches. In this OncLive peer exchange, I'm joined by an international panel of experts in the field of prostate cancer research. Uh, together, we will discuss the latest evidence surrounding the treatment of metastatic disease. We'll focus on current approaches for therapeutic sequencing and combination therapy, strategies to, ma strategies to manage resistance to antigen-targeted therapies, and treatment of prostate cancer associated with aberrant DNA repair. I am Professor Joe O'Sullivan. I am the Clinical Director of the Northern Ireland Cancer Centre in Belfast City Hospital in Northern Ireland. Joining me for this discussion is Dr. Johan de Bono, Professor of Cancer Medicine at the Institute of Cancer Research and the Royal Martin Hospital in Sutton, United Kingdom. Dr. Chris Parker, Clinical Oncologist at Royal Martin Hospital and Reader in Prostate Cancer Oncology at the Institute of Cancer Research in Sutton, United Kingdom. Also, Dr. Bertrand Tombal, Professor and Chairman of Urology at Clinique Universitaire Saint-Luc in Brussels in Belgium. Thank you for joining this discussion. Let's begin. We'll start with biology of prostate cancer. So, Bertrand, I'm going to start with you. Um, wh what is known about the differences in underlying biology between indolent and aggressive prostate cancers, and what are the genetic drivers, do you think? So it's been, it's been an important question for the last 10 years, and, and basically you can look at a three phase in the development. I mean, for 20 years, many people have been trying to look at a single individual genetic abnormality. If you think about P10 loss, RB loss, uh, there's been a lot of uh, work on microRNA, like MIR21, something like this. Usually, when you got it or not, it confer a higher aggressiveness, but the impact in uh, clinical decision was limited. The second part is all the work that has been doing in CRPC, part of the dream, the, 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 the dream teams, uh, work that's been done like in Robinson paper, where in the end we come with a list of what I call the usual suspect, meaning uh, cell cycle collaboration, again, AR uh, mutation, AKT P10 pathways and DNA repair mutation, but we're going to speak about that later on. And then the question is, and that's a very important one, is it something you acquire to treatment or so something that exists from the beginning? And that's where we have uh, latest update that it's probably the case. And if you take like work, like work done by Rob Brislow in Toronto, uh, you can find a uh, there is not one suspect, but in, if you look at a case that's going to die from the disease, very often, very early on, you find a lot of genetic instability and many of these markers being expressed. But based on this come two questions. What do we do with that in the clinics? And uh, does it impact treatment? Should you change your management based on this? So that observation is the base for new clinical trial. No, for a very, very uh, basic question, uh, we have commercial tests and they usually use a panel of, of, of genetic abnormalities which have been chosen based on historic. You've got Decipher, you've got Prolaris, you've got Oncotype DX. My view on it is that they can't tell yet who is really aggressive, but they can help you telling who is not indolent. So meaning the most useful to tell that patient should not go on active surveillance. But for the real question, like what kind of high-risk localized disease need escalation therapy versus standard therapy, we moving, there's not one genetic abnormalities. You find the usual suspect, P10, RB loss, and all the genetic uh, instability, plus many other CMEC, all of these. But that's going to be moving toward a panel that more than one driver. And Johan, what do you think yourself? Yeah, I would like to add to that. There is quite a lot of work indicating that um, the more indolent cancers have much less genomic aberrations, deleterious aberrations. So, for example, a paper in PNAS by Charles Sawyer's group indicating that the less um, genomic aberration burden you have, the more indolent the disease. And in fact, actually, if you look at all the data emerging from ICG, CTCGA, and even in Stand Up to Cancer group on the genomics, 
it's quite apparent that the more indolent cancers have much, much less burden genomically. What's also emerging is that if you have significant intrapatient, intertumor cell heterogeneity, that is the genomic instability that Bertrand mentioned, these cancers are much more likely to be lethal. Uh, and um, you know, this is going to be probably overall impactful with regards to selecting patients for more or less aggressive disease and maybe even different therapies. So clearly there's evidence that actually DNA repair defective cancers have a worse prognosis from diagnosis. I think there's quite strong evidence that for that, particular BRCA2. And uh, this may impact therapy. So it is possible, although we haven't got data yet, that the local therapy we give in a cancer would say HR defect or mismatch repair defect may need to be different. Local therapy, you know, uh, versus other cancers that don't. But these are questions that need addressed to clinical trials. And I don't think that today we could be making any recommendations yet, you know, about these data. Yeah. Can I just comment? So if we're talking about men on active surveillance with localised disease, then the clinical decision is do we treat them or not? And I'm a bit sceptical about the value of these commercial genetic tests because they've been developed in men who are not having MRI. I mean, standard of care right now, especially in the UK, for active surveillance is to monitor with MRI. So these commercial tests are only going to be helpful if they give added value over and above what we're getting already from MRI. And the That's concern is that actually if the lethal lesion is a small lesion that is perhaps not part of the main tumor mass and the MRI may even miss it, then this is probably never going to be feasible from these assays. Sure. But that, that's where you see that actually, if, even if you take standard nomograms and you adding these genetic tests on top of that, you have an added value which, which remain modest. Mm. So it means really that uh, the sampling error and the intrapatient heterogeneity is not something these tests are capturing really well right now.